I don't know if my slides are going to come up there, Steve, or. Can you see those, Brandon? We can. So, so hello, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Brandon Case. I'm the location manager for FIRST students, and I just want to talk a little bit about uh, transportation here. So who are we? Uh, we are the largest school transportation company in all of North America. We're running buses in 36 states currently. Um, here in Hawkinson, we're running 16 routes, and we just did STARS reporting. So we're running right about 1,750 students right now, um, which is a pretty good number for, for the amount of buses that, that we have. Um, what are we here for? And Steve, if you can go to the next slide. So obviously, you know, first and foremost, we're here for student transportation uh, to school and to home. We also provide co-curriculars. So anything from a football trip to, to um, a, a field trip. But we also want you to know that uh, we are a community member. So we're here as, you know, as a transportation company for Hawkinson, but we're also here as part of Hawkinson. So... Um, the little We Love Hawkinson sign there, uh, just to show the first students here, not just for the students. So. What services do we provide to the Hawkinson community? We have lots of things. Again, I talked a little bit about it, uh, home to school transportation to students. We have co-curricular transportation. Again, this could be anything from a sports trip to a field trip. And we also provide uh, community events, we can we can help out with that. If the school district at any point wants to be involved with uh, a community event such as a food drive um, or or a toy drive, we're we're there to help support it. And you go to the next slide, Steve. So, what are some of the new technologies that we can provide? This one's pretty uh, pretty important. So, obviously. You know, we got the Hawkinson Hawks there. You got to put it up there. Um, Hawkinson School, we love the community and the buses. So let's talk about the buses. New uh, Thomas School buses. Next slide. So just some, I, I want to talk some of the things of a school bus and why they're so safe and, and why it's uh, the most reliable transportation for our students to keep them. Uh, to get them to and from home in the school. So it is the most regulated vehicle on the road, believe it or not. Um, they're, they're even more regulated than any semi truck or, or a, a, even a transportation, um, in town transportation bus. Uh, they're painted yellow for a reason. It's high visibility. Those black, <clears throat> the black lines down the sides of the bus, I don't know if anyone knows, but those are actually, they have a purpose. They are actually reinforced. Um, the whole bus is reinforced, but the black lines show exactly where the students are sitting uh, in, in accordance with the bus. The bottom line is where they're actually seating, and the top line is the top of uh, where the, the students normally would be, if that makes sense. So again, like I said, it's reinforced steel. We do have all the bells and whistles on this. We do have radios, we do have cameras, so uh, there are cameras recording all the time. That is for the, the driver safety, it's for the student safety, and it's for the safety of the community. A lot of times, uh, you know, we hear that the cameras an invasion of pri privacy. It, that's not what it's there for, I promise. <laughs> it's there just to keep everyone safe and to make sure we know everything that's going on. Next slide. So a little something that I wanna take a little more time to talk about. So we have a couple things coming up. Uh, first view GPS self-guided tools. This is where I wanna spend most of the time, but right now I've been working with the Hawkinson Transportation Department and with my corporate per, uh, people, we've been setting up what's called the Parent App. The Parent App is, it's coming, it's coming soon. It's taking a little bit longer than we expected, but we're trying to make sure that everything is working correctly before we roll it out in full. We are getting ready to do an internal test. Um, we're actually gonna start next week uh, with the, the goals of actually getting this out to the parents on November the 12th. So hopefully that is gonna happen. We're still, still trying to get a couple of the uh, glitches out of the system, 
But what the parent app does, if we go to the next slide, so it can be used either on a computer or on a phone. And, and again, this kind of little heads up before anyone could see it. And it tracks the school bus. So each parent is going to have the ability to actually pick their student's route. And they're going to be able to follow that bus. So they'll know where it's at, if it's running late, if it's um, where it's at in relation to the school, both going to and coming from, and how far they are away from the stops. And we're also gonna have the ability to put messages out to the parents if something's going on or behind an accident. Um, we see that a lot here, especially lately, we've, we've had a few that slowed us down, uh, but now the parents are gonna know why, why is it running late? Maybe I have a sub driver out there. Believe it or not, we are in the same predicament as many, many other school districts out there. We're, we're not perfect, um, that is the first thing we'll, we would admit, um, but we try, try our darndest to get there and get it all done. But staffing is, it's, it's a challenge. So it's something we could put out there if we got a new driver, if, um, you, you know, if we're, we're running short on uh, staff and we have to combine a route. The, um, most of the times parents don't know. So what do they do? They flood the phone lines, both on our end and on the school districts and the schools. So this app should definitely uh, provide us with enough to kind of slow that, that down because communication, my number one goal is just to communicate, to be open, um, be transparent. This is something that we can give to the parents and the districts themselves are going to have something similar to it. It's called the district app. Uh, the difference is they're going to have access to all of the routes as opposed to a single route. Um, that the parents will have. Again, we're, we're just giving that parent that single ability. Um, it, we don't need, you know, they don't need to know where every other student is at on the road. Uh, but the districts, we want them to see exactly what we're seeing. And that's what we're coming from with the uh, parent apps. Um, so, so you, I got a question there, I see already. So yes, we do, uh, we are contracted through through your district, not through Battleground. So we do have two separate contracts, one with Hawkinson and one with uh, Battleground. So as you know, we do have both districts. Um, so there's quite a few buses out there. Hopefully that answered your question. So the parent app again, uh, back to that, I, I really do think that uh, this is gonna be a key to, to helping with some of the, the concerns um, we are still working through a lot of things and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, we, we do have staffing challenges just like everyone else. But one thing that I can say is we look a lot better than most districts out there. Uh, we are able, we're, we're covering all the routes. Um, that means sometimes I have staff out. A lot of times I'm the only dispatcher in dispatch, but that's what we do. We're, we're, we're here to get it done. Um, with that, uh, I, I think I know it's kind of short. I apologize, you get going and, and um, you know, things just start flowing. But I do want to open it up to questions as I was asked. Um, and, and we can ask as many questions as we have time for, please. I see Megan's got her hand up. I always have a question. Um, my question is, uh, my child has never ridden the bus. Uh, so it's really more of a curiosity uh, or concern is what are the security protocols about getting access to the app? Like, do you have to prove that it's your child? Do you get an access code to register for the yeah, parent so app? Because I worry, I I remember there was a kerfluffle with like a divorced couple and the dad picking up when the mom was supposed to. So I'm just wondering the security and the, the protocols. Absolutely. So there's actually a lot more information that's coming down um, the flow to, to the parents. Um, but yes, there's going to be a sign-up process. And with that sign-up process, there's going to be a code. A code's going to be given to the parent, and that code will be needed in order to get on and pick their student's bus or their route. Um, so there are security concerns, and that's something we all talked about in our meetings already. So um, well, yeah, we're not just going to uh, give the parents app, you know, rights to every bus, like I said. Uh, but that'll be done through through a code that is given from the district. That doesn't come from us, by the way. Um, we do provide it to the district, but the district's going to provide that to the parents. Does that answer your question, Megan? 
Yeah, um, I'm also wondering, because as I said, my child has never written the best. Um, I'm so tired of picking him up from school. Um, I would love to be able to put him on a bus and have him come back. Like for somebody who's never written the bus, I'm kind of curious to use the app to see what the actual time is, because all I hear are the horror stories, because you never hear the good stuff. Perfect. So I'm wondering if there would be any kind of like general information. I'm not asking for access to the app, but I could see people being like, oh, if my child road bus 206 what are the average are you going to have like mile markers reports on on efficiencies whatnot does that make sense because i could see this people trying to use it for more things than just where is my child now more so how efficient is it does that make yep. sense also okay yep that does make sense and and to be honest uh we're all figuring this out together i'm actually learning about the app myself um this is something that's new to me as well but there are going to be some efficiency reports, um, and there are there are several contacts that both a parent can contact, uh, and the district can contact, and I can contact as well. And that's with the company that monitors the app uh, within first student. So all of that stuff is getting ready to go get passed down to the parents, um, just kind of ahead of the game. But there are going to be ways that we can reach out and figure out what's going on. And by all means, at any point, reach out to myself or Ruben here at, here at First Student. Uh, we will get the info to you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think this is amazing. This will be wonderful. So thank you. I agree. Anybody else? Hey, Marissa, can I ask one question real quick? Of course. Floor is yours. So um, I know that, uh, you know, you guys came in with the the replacement of the previous uh, transportation company. How many of the people did you retain as um, drivers from the previous company to the one to, to you guys now? I can tell you most of my staff came from CST. So we did retain a, a large number of drivers. Um, I'd say about 90% of, of our drivers are from the old company. Does that answer your question, Brad? Thanks. Yep, that is. That's great. Thank you so much. You said 1,750 students that yes. you transport for Hawkinson? Yep. Based on those lines, it's shocking to me. <laughs> well, so, so Marissa, just so you know, the way the recording is done, it is AM and PM runs. Um, okay. So if you cut it in half, that's your student oh, numbers. That explains who I'm do. behind. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I apologize. I should have explained that, the, how the reporting done. <laughs> Yeah, so Brandon, you're saying the ridership is essentially doubled. It's kind of like when we were talking about school meals, is that it, the number, it, it wasn't like we were trying to inflate it, but we were providing a breakfast and a lunch every day. And so it's kind of like the multiplier by two because you have a round trip. Absolutely hey, um, correct. Brandon, could you speak to, I mean, I can speak to, uh, in a very general sense, how transportation intersects with levy funding. Um, state, you talked about STARS funding. Um, the state gives us uh, an allocation for transportation. It does not entirely cover all of the expenses that are tied to transportation. Um, those can kind of relate to geography and length of runs, correct? Um, it can relate to the amount of extracurricular transportation that is being provided. Um, then there's depreciation. Could you speak to um, the depreciation? Are you familiar with that at all, Brandon? Or is that something we, we just want to tackle um, kind of as a follow-up? <laughs> so I, I, I do know what depreciation is. Um, I don't know the exact numbers that uh, each bus depreciates. Uh, oh, each right. Year. So, Yep. So if we want that, that is something I can get off of the state website. Uh, no, not at all. I was just trying to say that that's another that's another expense that people don't always think about is that. Um, absolutely. And, it, the, and it, it's exactly uh, what, what it's the name states depreciation. So um, every year as the bus gets older, and we're putting miles on it. Um, you know, the, the bus is depreciating and we got to um, we have to look for for the cost of that. Um, there's maintenance involved. Um, um, and, and Steve, step in if, if you know, if, if there's more to it. Uh, but like I said, there is a certain amount that each year that every single bus 
depreciates. And, and I want to say something around 8,000. Um, but I, I would honestly have to look to get that exact. Number. No, I'm sorry. I didn't prepare you for that, but I was just <laughs> letting folks know that that's another expense. And yeah. of course, I think that um, the state's formula for depreciation doesn't always no. match. It the, does not always match. No. <laughs> the, the cost that we realize on the operating end. Yes. Um, and but fuel it's pretty is exciting one. that that first student brought in a fleet of brand new buses. And it was pretty remarkable given the supply chain issues that we're experiencing across the economy that you're able to do that. And it sounds like it was kind of a heroic effort to put some orders together to create you know, that huge replacement of our fleet here. Absolutely. So, so just a couple things that we did. Um, I, honestly, with all of the startups going on and with COVID going on and um, having to, to come up with 170 brand new buses between both districts, it was quite a feat. And we were expecting to come up all the way to the line right when school started before we were going to get majority of the buses. And, and we did a couple things just to kind of speed that up and to help both of the school districts out, to be honest. And, and that is we sent drivers um, both from, from the battleground uh, location and from a couple of our surrounding first student locations. And we sent them to North Carolina and had them drive the buses from North Carolina all the way back uh, to Washington for us. That was something that sped up that uh, quite a bit. And, and we're talking by a month, month and a half. Uh, so we were able to start getting through some of the processes because there's a lot. When this bus gets here, we still got to get through state patrol, which if you've ever, I told you, it's one of the strictest regulated vehicles uh, on the road. State patrol is who regulates, who follows the guidelines of the WAC. So that is uh, that is a huge process to get 170 buses through state patrol, um, get them licensed, which uh, we we still have temporary licenses right now. We've played paid for license plates that we probably won't see for a year, but that's a a Washington state um, uh, shortage right now. So it's not not a uh, us thing. So that's quite a few license plates we're waiting on. But it was quite a feat, Steve. Um, and, and by having the drivers that were willing to go pick up the buses, it sped up the process quite a bit. I have one more question for you, Brandon, if I yes, may. Sir. Um, are you going to do, when we roll out this app, do you have any parents that have kids on the bus, a small pilot group or a school? Or I just, you know, sometimes... Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned it real quick, but we do have an internal pilot that we're getting ready to kick off uh, next week. So we are going to test it and try and get all the bugs out before we send it off to the parents. Okay. And we were actually getting ready to, to jump. And on November 1st, we were going to go live. And that's when we realized is we're, we're all learning. Even I'm sitting through the meetings with James uh, and we're all trying to figure out the program that there's a couple bugs that we really want to work out to make sure it's perfect or near perfect before we get it out to the masses. So that is one of the things we are doing is we are going to run a pilot. And that's going to help both sides. That helps make sure that everything's working. And that helps my team make sure that we know because the majority of the processes for this program to work right is sitting right here at this in these offices here. So if we don't get it right, it's going to be a rolling effect. So we want to make sure we're on it. I wish you guys good luck. This is pretty cool. And I, I'm excited. Thank you for this presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Brian, do you have a question for Brandon? Yeah, it was uh, just along the lines kind of of what you were asking before there, Steve. So, um, is there a maintenance motor pool that also takes care of those from the community or how is that handled? No, nope, all the maintenance is done here on site uh, at our location. And um, I actually got a great maintenance team. So they're, they're going to keep up with everything. And something that uh, may or may not be known, our regional offices are right here in Vancouver. So I have help for anything that I need, um, whether it's maintenance or uh, personnel or, or, or anything. 
Oh, we even we right now I have four currently four drivers from Tacoma that are helping us out um, to to make this work. So um, we, we do it so all here on was, site, right? That was kind of the question I'm wondering: is of those people that you have driving and maintaining the fleet, um, do you have any idea of how much how many of those are community related members of Hawkinson um, that we're supporting through that, or are those you know kind of all spread out? Do you have any, any idea? I, I don't, unfortunately, but we are, we're all spread out. Um, I've got drivers and, and maintenance uh, personnel staff that, that are in Hawkinson, uh, Battleground. Some of them come as far as um, Vancouver. We got a lot in Vancouver, uh, but we, yeah, we're kind of all over the place. Okay, uh, thanks for that information. Thanks. Just know our hearts, it's, uh, it's here with you guys. Well, no, and, and uh, I guess my, my point is, and the reason I'm asking is because, again, those levy dollars pay for a lot of that. And we're looking uh, at ways that we can reinforce the, the support for the levy and back to the community. So when we have drivers that are part of the community that are being employed by some of those levy dollars, those can support, you know, some of the message for why the levy is important, not only for those those buses, but also for the community at large. And so I was just curious, you know, if you have some of that kind of information that you can share with us, I don't know if you can because of PII, but if you can, you know, maybe give us a percentage of how many are kind of Hawkinson residents um, that support the greater cause of, of the busing and transportation, that would be great to know. Yeah, Brian, if it's okay, I will look into it and get back uh, with you on that. And, and, and also remember, if there's anything the first student or myself could do to help support, even after this call, reach out at any time. I'm here for, for you guys. So, Absolutely. Thanks so much. You will so be Brandon, receiving a letter Brandon requesting McChesney a donation, just, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be sending you a letter for a donation request. Don't you All worry. Right. So, so Brandon, I want full disclosure here. Simon Soot and Brian A. Bear are the chairs of the uh, Citizens for Hawkinson Schools um, Committee. And so that's the YES group. And then Megan is also, she's lending her expertise with fundraising to that committee as well. Um, as we transition from Brandon to Keila Dean, I wanted to make uh, our citizens aware that I, I gave a short presentation on equity. And equity, fortunately or unfortunately, has become a kind of a politically charged word. Um, in our district, I think, we're really looking at equity as a way of equalizing access for students. Access to extracurricular participation, access to academic and academic success, um, access to necessary services such as um, health insurance, food, all these things that are, that are foundational for a student to focus on learning. Well, our state in, in its commitment to equity has put, a, I wouldn't say has shifted a lot of the burden, but has given the responsibility of transportation to school districts. And so a couple of examples are um, homeless students, whatever school district they declare as their district is their district. And we are responsible for transporting them. So we've, we've had students who reside in Portland and we are responsible for making sure they come to Hawkinson schools. We had another student who lived um, north of Yakult and that student was being transported by the Hawkinson school district to Hawkinson. So that's something that people may not be aware of. Another thing that um, shows a commitment to equity that is the responsibility of the providing district is um, Keila Dean oversees our special programming. And that basically implies that these are learners that have some unique needs, whether it's with language support, um, academic support, or you know, disabilities. And um, sometimes, those conditions necessitate special transport. And um, Brandon and his team 
go through trainings to, to develop kind of this equity eye so they can support students who have, you know, different uh, either challenges, or conditions, or abilities. And um, the other thing is sometimes it means like they have their own unique transportation. And that is another expense that it kind of translates through to levy because it's not always funded by the state. It doesn't always fit into the original formula. So that is um, a small segue into Keila Dean's presentation. Um, Keila, are you able to share your slides or do I need to find it? I can share. Okay. All right. And um, like Steve said, my plug for the bus, we've had a great relationship with transportation and supporting our students in special education and um, even students. Recently, we had an incident on one of the buses and we needed some extra support and Brandon offered to ride the bus himself to kind of check things out and see what was going on on the bus. So we appreciate your support for our programs. Okay, so I am here to share about special education. So first I just want to click the right screen. Okay. Um, uh, so this is me. I am Keila Dean, the Director of Special Programs. I want to share with you what brings me to this field is I have eight siblings. This is an old picture of my eight siblings last time we were all together. Um, they all tower over me now. Um, but uh, all of my siblings are um, people with disabilities. They all had support through their educational careers. Um, I watched my mom struggle with the school district on how to make sure that all my siblings had the right levels of support. And so that drove me to want to be inside the system to make sure that all of our students have the level of support that they need to be able to remove the barriers so that they can access their education. So um, I have degrees in speech and hearing sciences, school psychology, and an administrative credential specifically related to special education. Um, our, I, our special programs, Steve talked a little bit about they, them. They um, look at Title I and learning assistance programs that are programs for students that are perhaps typically developing, but maybe they are not quite achieving at the same level as their peers. So we offer some reading and math support to those students. Uh, our transitional bilingual education program, which uh, you may be more familiar with an ELL program, uh, that's what it is called now. I also work with our equity team. I am the coordinator for 504s and um, the director for special education as well. So today is about special ed, which is my, might be my favorite. Um, so first, I just want to give you kind of an overview of what special education is. So students are eligible for special education. It's a team determination. So that team is made up of the student's family, as well as the professionals from our school. There are three prongs that make a student eligible for special education. The first being that the student will be identified as having a disability. The second, that there's an adverse educational impact. So because of we have lots of students in our school that have disabilities that don't need special education services, that they don't need a 504, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, and are able to um, achieve just as well as their peers. But if they have a disability and they have an adverse educational impact, they might need some extra supports, and that's a 504. So that just means maybe we give them a little extra time on assignments, for students that are diabetic, we might have a plan that they can check their blood sugar. Um, sometimes we have students with more significant needs that uh, perhaps need a full-time nurse. They don't need special education, but through the 504 process, they might need a nurse because of their medical needs. Um, that level of uh, a 504 is not funded. And so anything that we're doing with um, 504 has to come from our general funds. Uh, we don't get additional funds from the state to support students on 504s. So uh, 
if a student is determined that they have a disability, that they have an adverse educational impact, and they have a unique set of needs that require specially designed instruction, at that point, we would determine that they're eligible for special education services. So um, the next piece would be looking at how do we meet those student needs. So here in Hawkinson, we support student ages 3 through 21 with our programs. I do have an asterisk because we actually provide services for children birth to 3 as well, but that's just a pass through that we um, work with ESD to provide those services. So our campuses here, we focus on children ages 3 through 21 with disabilities. We have currently 199 students in program, so that's 10% um, of our students are served in special education. So if you think about it, there's an average of two to three students with disabilities in every classroom. Uh, next, I list out the disabilities that are represented within our district. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about each one of those. So autism is a spectrum disorder. Uh, it's we have support students who may be severely impacted by their disability and they might need a lot of support a one on one adult with them to make sure that they're getting all of their needs met. We also have students with autism that need really limited support, maybe just some check ins on how to have appropriate social interactions with their peers once a week we kind of meet with them and give them some instruction around that. Otherwise they're in the gen ed class with all of their peers. Uh, similarly with communication disorder, often those students are just being pulled out of the class for um, once or twice a week sessions to work on uh, articulation errors, how they pronounce like their R's or their L's, uh, perhaps a language disorder, something like that, they, they're pulled out of the class for that. Student with a uh, student with developmental delay is a student that's under the age of nine that has um, isn't achieving as well as their peers and they have a significant delay and so we provide them with some instruction. Students with emotional behavioral disabilities, this can target students that have either internal struggles or external and so our students with anxiety and depression that might need some support coming into the special education classroom to learn how to um, manage their anxiety or it could be students with more um, externalizing behaviors where they're hitting or kicking, um, having some, some big behaviors that we are supporting them on how to self-regulate. Uh, our students with intellectual disabilities are students that have uh, been identified as um, having a, a significant cognitive impairment. Students with multiple disabilities are students that uh, meet the criteria for multiple disabilities. And there's no one disability that's more significant than the other. So they might have a motor impairment and they have autism or something like that, where they have a combination of disabilities. Other health impairment um, is a description for students with a medical diagnosis. So most typically we see students with ADHD that are found eligible with other health impairment. So they might be able to achieve as well as uh, typically developing peer, but uh, they need a, le a little extra instruction in supporting their attention to be able to demonstrate those skills. Uh, orthopedic impairment is a student who has uh, motor difficulties, and so they might need some support from our physical therapist on how to, uh, to, use, to get around our campus to use the stairs. Uh, our, fine, our occupational therapist will help develop their writing skills. Uh, we have a large population of students with specific learning disabilities. So these students have uh, been identified as struggling in reading, writing, and or math. And so they might come to the resource room if they're secondary for just their English class. The rest of the classes, they go to the gen ed class or in elementary school, they might just be pulled out for 30 minutes of instruction uh, to work on their reading skills. We additionally have students with traumatic brain injury. So these are students that have had some sort of brain injury that significantly impacts their ability to uh, engage in the class. Uh, oftentimes we see this not just academically, but with physical impairment um, as well as adaptive impairment, their ability to feed themselves or dress themselves. Uh, and then we have students that are visually impaired as well. So they need some extra supports in being able to um, read and we see, or to be able to see things. And we've uh, recognized that those students, uh, because of their 
difficulty with vision have at times developed other academic struggles as well that we need to support them with that. Uh, there are other disability categories that students can be eligible, but uh, these are the ones that are represented within our district. Brian, I see that you have your hand raised. Do you have a question? Well, it was raised from previous, but I do have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, it, it, maybe there's more to your presentation here that there is more. you can go through, but yeah. um, is there support for students that are on the opposite spectrum that are like highly capable that maybe have learning disabilities because of their, their spirit, that they're, mm -hmm. they're highly capable in what they do and that kind of stuff. And does that roll into your role as well? So we do support students. So we do have a highly capable program. That's a different program outside of me. Uh, but we do have students that are in special education that may also access our highly capable program. So we would support both of those needs through our district. And those fall under that special ed cap category as well? Um, this, the high cap students, if they are only high cap, they do not fall under special education. But if they are high cap and have a disability that we've identified through special education, then yes, that would fall under special ed. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I just briefly want to talk about our obligations. And so number one, our obligation as for Hawkinson is to prepare every student for lifelong success. Um, with that, we must look at all potential areas of need for special education students. So that means we have to, we are legally required to look at all areas of need. So that's reading, writing, and math is what you typically think of, but we have to look beyond that to their adaptive skills, their motor skills, um, and make sure that we're providing services for those pieces too, social, emotional, behavior, communication. The students' needs are determined by their IEP team. So that's the team. Um, of the parent and the specialist from, um, from the school. So that team will come together and decide what the student needs. Um, so once that's determined, well, one of the things that we are again required to look at, we're obligated by the state to look at is the least restrictive environment and we must provide a continuum of services. So what that means in the world of special education is that we want students to be able to be with typically developing peers as much as possible. And so our goal is always to have our students in special education in the general education class with their peers as much as we possibly can. And so as in when we're meeting as an IEP team, we have that in our focus and we're looking at how do we provide them the support that they need while continuing to allow them to access general education. That means that we need a continuum of services. So like I spoke about, we have some students that may just need a little bit of support where they have 30 minutes a week that they're coming for services. We have other students that might need a one-to-one -one aid. And we have students that might need to be in the special education classroom for the majority of their day to meet their needs. So we need to be able to offer everything in between. Uh, the IEP is a legally binding document. And so anything that that team determines that that student needs, we are required to provide. So if we are saying that the student needs an IE, uh, one on one paraeducator, then we have to provide them with that paraeducator. So to talk uh, briefly about our programs here in Hawkinson, we have an integrated preschool. So that is a preschool with for kids three to five that are uh, integrated. So we have, uh, our goal is to have 50% special education students in that class and 50% typically developing peers. We have three classrooms at each of the elementary, middle and high school. We have uh, classrooms represented in each building for our resource, our learning support classrooms where we're working primarily on reading, writing and math skills. We have classes where we focus on more social emotional learning. And in each building, we have a classroom that focuses on our students with more significant needs. Um, those are our developmental resource rooms. So typically students in those class will be significantly impacted by their disability in four or more areas. Uh, additionally, we have a transition program that supports our students ages 18 through 21. So when they graduate from high school, they go to our transition program. And at that point, they learn, we focus more on skills that they'll need to prepare for um, their adult life. We do volunteer work out in the community to give them job skills. We do grocery shopping, uh, all sorts of exciting things. It's a good place to be. 
So within those programs, these are the staff that directly support students. We have currently 21 paraeducators. I'm still on the hunt for another one. If you know anyone, please have them apply. Um, we have nine special education teachers. We have seven registered behavior technicians. This is an addition, a new addition to our programming. Um, these are paraeducators that have an additional, additional layer of training to focus in on behavioral needs. We have two school psychologists. They uh, do the assessments for students to determine eligibility and also support with ongoing needs around um, behavior, especially. We have two speech language pathologists. Uh, board certified behavior analyst. Again, this is a relatively new position for our district that supports students with um, more significant behavioral needs and also supervises the RBTs. We have one speech language pathologist assistant who supports our students with speech needs. She's uh, support to the R2 SLPs. We have an occupational therapist, a physical therapist. Uh, we also have contracts with the teacher of students with visual impairments, teacher for the deaf and hard of hearing, and an audiologist. So we have students that have IEPs that recommend all of these different levels of service. So we have um, these different people that are available to help support our students. This is, it's an expensive program. So I'm gonna do my best to explain this document when I am not a numbers person. So um, the very top column is the years. Uh, so starting in the 15, 16 year, moving all the way to our 21, 22. And then we have some actual numbers and some budgeted numbers. When we move down, we see that there is the revenue. So this um, special education is funded by the state and um, federal monies. And so that is the money that we receive. However, we are not fully funded. And so um, the next line is our expenditure for each of those years. And then the money in the parentheses that we, that is our levy money that we use to help support. So unfunded SPED is that bottom percentage. So I do wanna look closely at a couple of years. The 1920 year, you can see the budgeted. We were budgeted um, to need 725,378 levy dollars. Um, that in actual, that didn't happen because we used um, ESSER funds to address some of that financial need. That's the same with the 2021. We had a more significant anticipated need. However, we were able to use ESSER funds to address some of that need. And then this year, our um, budget is, we anticipate needing 33% of our special education budget to be funded through levy. Uh, and finally, I just wanna share some unexpected variables, variables that come up that impact our finance in special education. Um, a big piece is students that are transferring into our district. I will share that this year we have had um, more students ever than ever before transfer in um, to our district with some significant needs. So we have had eight students move in this year that needed one-on-one -on -one support. And so a one-on-one -on -one paraeducator costs about $40,000 um, with their benefits and full-time. So for each of those students that necessitate that level of support, like I said, it already exists in their IEP. That's something that we have to provide to them or if they come to us and they're demonstrating that need, that's something that we need to evaluate and provide. Uh, additionally, students' needs can change. So we may create our budget with the anticipation. Usually I build in one extra paraeducator because that's what I anticipate that we may have a need throughout the year that I might need one extra. Um, but as, so a student's need might change that they need some extra support. So that can change our budget. Uh, additionally, we work with Vancouver and Evergreen and access some of their programming for our students with some significant needs. So um, they have schools that are uh, intended specifically for students with disabilities that have some big behaviors. And when, if we are not able to meet those needs here, then we can work with them um, and we contract with them to be able to have our students attend those schools. Uh, and then we also have new students qualifying for services. So we're at um, a high right now of 199 students eligible for special education. And we um, are always have students in the process determining eligibility. So we have multiple students right now in each building that we're going through the evaluation process to determine whether or not they need special education support. Okay, that's the end. Thank you for that.
Thank you, Keila. I see that Simon has his hand raised. I'll go ahead and open the floor 